Good morning everyone, this is Dan and this is the Napkin Academy. Today we're going to be talking about how to draw anything. And the simple idea is this. With practice, we can learn to draw anything. And I really mean that. So today, more than anything else, is about building confidence. And so what I'd like you to do, so I want everyone to take a moment and go grab a pencil and a sheet of paper and put it on the desk in front of you because I'm going to ask you to draw along with me as we go today. And we're going to take it slowly and we're going to build step by step. The reason why drawing is important, of course, rule number three from show and tell is we've learned that if we really want to make an extraordinary presentation, we'll tell the truth, we'll tell it with a story, and more particularly, we will tell that story with lots of pictures. Pictures of all sorts. Those are what make our story really come to life. And the pictures that we're going to talk about today are drawings. And I think that hand-drawn pictures are absolutely wonderful. With practice, these require very little time to create. Our pictures can show exactly what we want. Our pictures are very warm. They're inviting to look at, which means that they show a real human touch, which is lovely when we're making a presentation because people love to know that they're being spoken to and are speaking with another human. And our drawings are easy to keep simple. You know, there are a couple of negatives about drawings as well. We should just touch on them because this is what we're going to elaborate on today. To make our drawings, it requires, obviously, some basic drawing skills. That's what today's lesson is all about. And it is true that our drawings can become sometimes overly cutesy, and that might not be the ideal thing if we're in a very professional situation. So what we're going to talk about is how to make our drawings still hand-drawn, but also very professional-looking. What are we going to draw pictures of? Well, we all know this. Our 6 by 6 tells us if we're talking about who's and things, we draw portraits, how much we draw our chart, where we draw our map, when we draw our timeline, how we draw our flowchart, and why we draw our visual equation. I want to start with a quick Q&A, questions and answers about drawing. And why do we start with this? Because I'll tell you, there are many times when I talk about drawing that people come with me immediately with a series of questions. So let's get them out of the way first. The first question everybody asks is, well, what if I can't draw? And my answer to you is, I'm pretty sure that you can. And here's what I mean. It's really important to remember that when I talk about doing quick drawings, I'm not trying to say that we need to make a beautiful representation of the world that we see out there. There may be times we want to do this, but I'm more intrigued in us drawing the world that we see in here. When we think tree, what is the image that we see? When we think airplane, what is the image that we see? I'm not worried about how accurate your drawing is on paper. I'm worried how wonderfully we can capture what's in our mind. Often, that's nothing more than very basic, simple shapes. We just need to have the tools to be able to figure out what those shapes are and nail them down on our piece of paper. Question number two. Well, what if I've tried drawing and my drawings still look terrible? The answer, you know what it is. Practice. And the, the, the crazy thing about this is so many people say, I can't draw, I'm a verbal person. Well, hold on a minute. Let's think back to when we were little tiny babies, you know, just bundled up. There we are, little babies. Uh-huh. How well did we talk then? I don't think very well, blah, 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 blah. It took us years and years and years of practice to get to the point where we were as fluent verbal communicators as we are today. We don't, most of us, have that practice when it comes to drawing. So no wonder we think most of our drawings stink. You know, the first time we spoke, we didn't sound, we didn't make any sense either. But it didn't take too long until we started to make sense. The same thing is true of our pictures. So let's keep trying. And the last question people say, Dan, that's fine, I got it. But what if I really, 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 and I mean really can't draw? All right, well, we've still got some options. We can always find someone who can, and we can sit down next to them and describe what we're thinking. You know, we can find our images online, which is what we talked about last time, and we can use simple shapes and make basic graphics using the simple tools that are available within our software and that's what we talked about last time and in worst case we can even create simple charts using our spreadsheets but for today I don't want us to do any of those things because we really 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 can draw and the last question before we dive into it is many people say okay so how am I going to use technology to draw 
you know, I've got this shiny new iPad or this new Surface or this new tablet computer. I've got all this great software on it. How can I use the computer to help me draw? Well, you know what? For today, let's not even worry about that. Let's focus on pen and paper because there is no software that has ever been invented or will ever be invented that is any better than us taking a pen and drawing on a sheet of paper. It is such a wonderful task for us to do. The connection, the tactile connection between our brain, our hand, and the surface of the paper is something that cannot be simulated with software. Drawing on a piece of paper. And besides, the other thing is anything I tell you today about hardware and software is going to be out of date in a week given all of the new tools that are rolling out. So let's focus on the paper part. Computers are great. We will touch on them. But you know, it's never the computer that draws. It's always us. All that computers do is make it a little bit less messy. We're going to make drawings. How are we going to add them into our presentation? There are two ways, one and two. The first way, and this is the one I emphasize the most, we take a piece of paper, we take our pencil, we draw our shape, sketchy, on that piece of paper. Then, after we've drawn it with pencil, we draw over it with a solid line with our big fat Sharpie pen. We're using the basic pencil lines to guide us. And then what we do, of course, is we physically, literally, erase the pencil lines from underneath. And we're left, if I did it right, we're left with just our lovely, nice, big, black, bold image. And then what we do is we take our camera, or our camera phone, or our big desktop scanner, and we take a photo, or a scan, of that image and now we've digitized it and now we've got this lovely image that is clearly hand-drawn we open it up in Photoshop or any other image editing program we clean it up a little bit we erase a little bit here perhaps we add some let's do it right now perhaps we add a little bit of color over here we make the body blue and I like to do this in Photoshop I like to keep my drawings just simple black and white and then of course when we're all done we save that file and then we open up our PowerPoint or our Keynote or our Prezi and we simply import that picture we put it into our presentation and voila like magic we've now got our picture in our presentation the second way of course directly to that question is we pick our favorite hardware and software mine happens to be a tablet PC running PowerPoint we draw our image just as I've done here we save our image and then we simply insert it into our deck, into our slideshow. So those are our two ways. So let's go ahead now and warm up and do a little bit of drawing. The way we're going to break drawing down is we're going to talk about it in sort of four categories. We're going to start with very, very basic shapes. With our basic shapes, we're going to walk through how to draw things. Then we're going to talk about how to draw people. And then we're going to talk about how to draw ideas. Let's start with those basic shapes. All of you, I would like you to put that piece of paper and pen or pencil in front of you. Hold that pencil and draw along with me. All drawing starts with just five simple shapes. Draw one with me. Let's draw a square. I've actually put a little piece of graph paper here to help me draw. You might want to do that or just wing it. We don't care how accurate our drawings are. Now let's draw a circle. Now let's draw a triangle. Let's draw a line. And let's draw some kind of a blob. That works so well. Let's do it one more time. Let's draw another square. Let's draw a smaller one. Let's draw a bigger one. Let's draw some more circles. Let's draw little, little tiny circles. Let's draw a big circle. Let's draw ovals. All we need to do is stretch that circle. Oh, and what happens if we stretch the circle and turn it on an angle? And if we can do it really far, we've got a hot dog. Our triangles. We can make long, skinny triangles. We can turn triangles on their sides. This is all just good warm-up for us. The basic shapes. Little tiny triangle. Turn the triangle over. Uh-oh. Lines. Not so hard. We can make lines going in different directions. If we really want to be funny, interesting, we can put an arrow at the end of one of our lines. No problem with lines. And blobs, those are really easy. Just let your fingers kind of express whatever they want. Just draw some blobs on there. 
Those are the five basic shapes. If we can draw just those, we can draw anything. Let's start with a few things that are based on some of those shapes. Here I've just identified a few things and if someone wants to send me a list using the chat window or the question window, if you want to send me some requests for other things that we might want to draw, send them through. So how would we draw a bicycle? Well, as we can see, we start with circle number one. We then draw circle number two. We put a triangle in between them, just our basic shapes a couple of lines, maybe another circle right here, another circle right here, maybe a little triangle, presto, we've got a bicycle. A city, well we see what a city is, it's basically a bunch of squares, we could do the same thing for a house. How do I draw my house? Well, maybe I draw a square, another square, another square, another square, uh oh, I'm gonna get really fancy now, I'm gonna put a triangle on top, maybe another square, I've got a house. How beautiful are these? Not particularly beautiful. Are they good enough for a presentation? Absolutely they are perfect for a presentation. Let's give a big thumbs up there. These are perfect drawings because everybody can see exactly what they are and the fact that we draw them live makes people very happy. What about a process? Okay, well often people talk about the sales process as something like a funnel. So how do I draw a funnel? Well I draw a triangle, I add a little box at the end. That's not a bad funnel. Maybe I put a little circle at the top to indicate that it's an open funnel. I can round it out the bottom too. If I really want to be clever, I can use a couple of circles to add a handle onto that funnel. And then I can say a bunch of different boxes go into my funnel. These are all my sales prospects. And at the end comes one box. Or perhaps if I want to get clever about it, I can say what comes out is a nice three-dimensional shape of a box. How about something like that? So that's how we draw with just our basic shapes. And again, all we're trying to do is not say I want a beautiful representation of a bicycle. I want to say in my brain as I'm pondering I say bicycle. What image comes into my mind when I say that? That's what I'm trying to capture and it may take practice again to get it but that's what we're after. What is the image that comes to mind? Let's take a few more examples and I've got a question coming in from Oleg asking how to draw a dinosaur. All right, well, here's some simple ones. We'll get to a dinosaur. Let's say I wanted to draw a clock. I could take a circle. Let's say it's an alarm clock. I put two half circles on top. I connect it with another half circle. I put a couple of my triangles here, maybe a couple more triangles for feet. And if I really want to be clever about it, I can put some time around there. So there's a clock, but let's not forget the dinosaur. I don't know, let's talk about a dinosaur. I'm guessing, depending on which type, a Tyrannosaurus. I'm guessing we could draw a good Tyrannosaurus with a triangle, a couple of legs here, a couple of blobs there, perhaps another triangle head like this, another triangle, a big swoopy one on the back. I'm not sure if this is a great dinosaur. It's not much of a Tyrannosaurus rex, but we could draw some kind of evil creature with our basic shapes. And I'll bet we could even do more sort of a Brachiosaurus. So let's start out with a, a square four big fat square legs for our brachiosaurus. Let's put a circle on the back of that and then we know a brachiosaurus has got a long swoopy neck. So let's do something like that. Put a circle on the end and a long swoopy tail on the other side. Give him a couple eyes. Brachiosaurus was never the smartest of the dinosaurs I guess. So he's a happy one. No, he's not a very happy one because he's about to get eaten by the world's ugliest T-Rex. So there we've got some dinosaurs, basic shapes. Timeline, of course, easy enough. Square with a triangle, square with a triangle. We can make a timeline. Phones, phones in the old days used to be hard to draw, right? You had to draw lots of circles. Something like this and then this curly blobby line. Now it's easy to draw a phone. You just draw a square put a little circle on it. There's our screen. Thank you Steve Jobs for helping us not have to draw phones like that anymore. Of course the trouble is, it's funny isn't it, whenever we see an icon of a phone it still looks more like that because an icon of a phone that just looked like that wouldn't really tell us a lot would it? Uh, and just a couple of more basic types of things that we can draw using our basic shapes. Okay we wanted to draw an airplane. Well here's how to draw an airplane. Let's talk about drawing a car. Couldn't I just make a box, put another box on top, a couple of wheels, 
a couple of headlights there, maybe put some more boxes on here to really indicate what kind of a car it is. Now I could even turn it into a station wagon or an SUV by adding another box on the back. All right, there's a car. Oh, drawing a problem is always fun. Just take one of our line blobby swirls and say, there it is. <laughs> there's the problem we're going to try to solve. Okay, that's not so hard. And, okay, Aleg, you know, I was ready for some animals. You'd ask for a dinosaur. We could draw a dog. We did our dinosaur a moment ago. I don't know. What else could we try to draw? Anybody else have an idea for an animal we want to quickly draw? Oh, the hummingbird. Okay, fabulous. All right, Maria, so let's try to do the hummingbird. So, uh, hummingbird, I actually draw a hummingbird in a pretty ugly way. I draw a little hot dog. I give it a beak, two eyes, and then the wings are just these sort of feathery things around the edge, and then put a little tail on the back. And the main indicator, of course, that it's a hummingbird is it's got this absurdly long beak and the, the fact that its wings are going in a blur. beauty of drawing a hummingbird is you don't have to worry about drawing wings. Drawing wings on a bird can be really, really hard, you know. Every time you draw an eagle, it's got these great wings on it. So lots of things we can draw. A kangaroo. Oh, great. John, oh, thanks so much. Okay, let's think about a kangaroo. I'll bet a kangaroo is a triangle. It's got a long tail on it, doesn't it? It's mostly tailed, our kangaroo. It's going to look a lot like our T-Rex. In fact, I'm going to go back to that old T-Rex. A couple of circles here. Big long feet. A little pouch, another half circle. Kangaroo's head. I, I'm trying to hard... Yeah, probably just a triangle like that. Big ears on a kangaroo, I think. Pointy nose. All right. Not the worst kangaroo. Hey, let's do this the style that I was advocating. Let's say that that red represented a pencil, and now I've, I like it. So now what I do is I go back in over and just outline it to get my final drawing. Something like that and put the little pouch in. I don't know. That's not the world's worst kangaroo. All right, that'll work. Okay, point is, with a little practice, with our basic shapes, we can draw all of these different kinds of things. Well, that's great. Well, one of the things that we're going to find that we need to draw, of course, from time to time, is we're going to figure out we need to draw people. Well, here's how I suggest drawing people. About as simple as you can possibly make it. I've put this grid in here because I think of people when we're drawing stick figures is we want to base it on thirds. An accurate human drawing. Uh, let me see if I can do it now. An accurate human drawing, the head, I believe, is about one-seventh, three, four, five, six, seven. An accurate adult human, I think the head is about one-seventh of the body of the full height, something, something about like this. So that's more or less an accurate proportional human, something about like that. And the head is, is of course, it's shaped more like this. The head is relatively uh, short compared to the body. But when we're going to draw our stick figures, we forget this kind of proportion. We're not interested in real pictures of people. We're interested in people that look instantly like people. The head is one-third the body. The body is one-third. The legs are one-third of the height. We add a couple of arms. And now we've got a pretty ugly but satisfactory stick figure. I guess what I probably forgot there is I didn't really put in much of a neck. So let's do another one. Let's make a little bit better stick figure and maybe drop the arms a little bit down now. And there we get a slightly better stick figure. And let's do one more. Let's do a stick figure that's uh, take, that's at, uh, running. Let's do a little stick figure that's running. So pieces remain more or less the same in proportion. Well, I don't know if this one's running, but he's, he's certainly he's walking at a rapid pace. So stick figures are great because they show us the basic idea of a person and what I really love about stick figures is they're ideal for when we want to show emotions. So when we want to show someone saying yes, we want to show someone saying oh that's fine. We want to show someone saying oh that's not exactly what I wanted or ack that's terrible. The thing I really love about our little stick figures is with very little effort we can make them really sad. Oh my goodness, what a sad stick figure. Or we can make them so happy 
that they are just bursting with energy or we can make them what else might we want to do? Any, someone give me an idea. What would you like us to see? It's, what kind of emotion would you like us to try to portray on a stick figure? See if we can even do it. Uh, surprised. Oh, okay. That's a good one. I think, how would we do surprised? Well, it depends. This, this person could be shocked. This is terror surprise. Maybe because they've just seen a skeleton coming at them. So of course this person is very shocked and surprised. They're being chased by a skeleton stick figure. Um, we could do, uh, oh, frustration. Oh, I, I, I have an idea how to do frustration. Person is standing there, very stiff. Arms straight up mouth is a solid line. Eyes are very small. I think we could do a kind of a grrr. Some teeth showing. Ah, uh, and maybe a little bit of steam coming off. I think this person is quite frustrated. Either that or they've just stepped into a... <laughs> they're walking over burning coals. One or the other. A little bit of effort, you can show lots of things, which is why I love doing our stick figures. So, we're going to shift a little bit. We're going to move away from stick figures and we're going to go into something that I'm going to call block figures. Block figures are drawn a little bit differently than our stick figure. If with our stick figure we started with the head, with a block figure we actually start with the body. And we draw a little block like this and then we add a head and then we add two legs and two arms and then the face. And what block figures are really good for is when we want to show someone taking action. So, uh, you know, let's say we wanted to make one of our block figures running. We can do the same thing. There's our running block figure. And let's say we wanted to make a block figure that's resting. Maybe we put our block on the side. And let's think, how do we rest? Well, maybe we put a leg like this, and we cross the other leg like this. We lay our head back. We put our arms behind our head. We smile and we close our eyes maybe something like that on a sunny day. So the only action we're taking at this point is total inaction. Uh, what else could we do with our block figure? Anybody has an action that they'd like us to try to represent? I know, let's just have someone reaching really high up, stretching out on tippy toe, trying to reach something that's on the top shelf. Oh, am I going to be able to make it? I'm trying to reach the cookies that are up here on the, on the top shelf standing on tiptoe. Oh, I can barely make it. So action, fa oh, swimming. Okay, swimming. Yeah, how would we do swimming? You know what I'm going to do for swimming? I'm not actually, the block is here. The head is back. One leg is kicking like this. One leg is kicking like this. This arm is scooping forward. This arm is back. And here's the water level. And so the person maybe is swimming like that. And they're wearing goggles, of course, as they swim. And we put some speed lines and perhaps some splashing as we go. So just more examples of actions that we can show with our block figures. And there's a third type of uh, stick figure, if you will, that I call the blob figure, often called the star figure. We call it this because we draw the person just like that. It's a star where the upper point is actually a circle. Now, I don't find these to be super useful as a way of drawing people uh, because no matter how what we try to show our star person doing uh, they always end up look liking, looking kind of like they're dancing which isn't necessarily bad but it's rare that people are spending that much time dancing together what I find are really interesting about blob figures is when we want to show quickly a large group of people we can draw these really fast much faster than we can draw the blob figures or the stick figures so if I want to say there are two different groups of people. I've got my red people and I've got my purple people. Doing our little blob figures, star figures is a way to generate really quickly the idea that there are sheer numbers of people and then what's interesting is it's a very good way to show what are the relationships uh, between these people. So clearly there's a group of red people over here and a group of purple people over here and I can see 
that there is a distance or a wall in between them. So that's where block figures are really good. Everybody following me so far? A lot of rapid fire drawing and I hope uh, some of you are able to keep up a little bit on your own. Let's go ahead and do a little bit more drawing. Let's move away from people now and let's go ahead and move into ideas. So up to this point we've been able to draw things and we've been able to draw people. But let's face it, when we're giving presentations often we're going to be talking about big ideas. How do I draw a process? Well, the simplest way we've already explored. I can draw a process by putting together my boxes and my arrows and creating a timeline and I might then illustrate that timeline by saying this is step one, two, three, and four and perhaps in step one I end up I have a bunch of random pieces. In step two I put those pieces together. In step three perhaps I'm just making this up as I go I move that thing up and then in step four uh, what am I going to do with step four? Okay step four I raise it even higher and now I've sent my thing all the way out to the moon. Okay so there's a process very simple way of drawing a picture of a process which believe me and I'm sure all of you know this is a whole lot more effective than writing out an incredibly elaborate uh, outline of all the steps in the process. It's always good to outline all the steps in the process. It's even better to have this written outline be supported by or support the visualization, the picture of the process. So a position. What do I mean by a position? Well perhaps we are here today and here is our objective and we would see that our position is a great distance away from our objective but perhaps tomorrow we will be surrounding our objective so how do I draw a position very simply with my charts I show where I am now and where I'm going to be and I provide a vector or a sense of direction to show how I'm going to shift my position what about some other kinds of ideas what about a concept let's think about a concept um, one that comes into my mind is this idea of uh, innovation you know people are talking a lot in business these days about innovation or maybe we could call it really rapid progress well we might say again that we start here with this square and then we change it a little bit and perhaps we bend it a little bit and turn it into a diamond and then perhaps we take that diamond and we uh, we round it out a little bit and then perhaps we turn that into a circle. So here's a way of illustrating with a picture what perhaps we might mean by innovation or progress. This series of iterative shifts that move us from one thing to another. That might be one way to do it. Uh, another way perhaps to illustrate innovation would be to say this is what we have today. We're not going to do that anymore. We're simply going to do this. So we've skipped a lot of the intermediate steps. We might call this disruptive innovation illustrated like this. There is no transition. We stop doing what we did and we have something new come out. And what we're really looking at here is a way of drawing a picture of an equation. And for those of you who've been with me for a little while, you know what I mean when I talk about a visual equation. It's the sort of the moral of the story. The big why am I trying to explain a concept to someone? And it might be as simple as saying, look, I think that we should change because being happy is better than being unhappy, at least in the circumstances that we care about for now. So why are we doing this? Because of this truth. So how do we draw our visual equations? Typically we just take some of our most simple little drawings that we did before and we put some sort of mathematical operator in between them. So for example I might say that a square plus change gives me a circle, which is yet another visual way of describing innovation, isn't it? Taking what I already have, changing it, either a little or a lot, to end up with something else. So this is how we can illustrate things, people, and ideas. And I want to conclude by talking just a little bit about really pushing how do we illustrate ideas because it's more than just the drawing now, it's really coming up with a good metaphor for something. So in our case of this word, innovation, which has many, many meanings, what we might want to do is come up with our visual metaphor 
that could be anything, innovation, could be change, it could be that we, uh, I don't know if this is actually accurate, but perhaps we start with a little caterpillar climbing on a branch. I don't know if this exactly counts as innovation or not, but we know that one of the things that happen, let's call this change, a metaphor for change. We know what happens is that that little caterpillar turns itself into a pupa, and that little pupa turns itself into this incredibly gorgeous butterfly. How did that happen? Isn't that something? So here we have a metaphor for innovation or for change. And I want us to move a little bit now from just the simple building blocks of drawing our squares and our triangles and our circles and our smiley faces and stick figures into thinking about what larger picture do we draw using these pieces. And I think there are two kinds of metaphors that we're going to find are incredibly powerful. One are metaphors, visual metaphors, that come from the natural world. And there are many kinds here that are easy to draw. So a calm sea with the sun rising over. Certainly it's a drawing of an ocean, but what does it represent? A new day, a new opportunity, great potential, what's beyond the horizon. And if we bend our water a little bit into a big wave, wow, now we have a tidal wave. What does that indicate? Well, perhaps we're unprepared. Perhaps the, the internet, uh, perhaps disruptive in innovation is coming at us like a tidal wave that wipes everything out. Or perhaps when we fall in love, you know, we think everything's calm and then boom, we're completely overwhelmed by this wave. Another water metaphor, flow, just draw a simple river. And what might that tell us? Well, obviously it's a river, but it's telling us about things being fluid and about being ever-changing and about time. We could draw a big mountain. Clearly it's inspiring, this peak. Perhaps climbing it represents the ascent that we need to make. Perhaps sitting on the top is the brilliant guru who is the font of knowledge that we're trying to reach. Another visual metaphor, perhaps a tornado. Very, very simple to draw, representing chaos and anger. A tree, not so hard to draw and incredibly powerful. Could be a family, any network whatsoever could be a representation perhaps of Facebook you know here's me and here are all my friends and fans and family out here and they get bigger and bigger and expand bigger and bigger just like a tree or maybe we could take just a little nut a little shrunken nut from a tree we could talk about something that's very compact very hardened <laughs> maybe this is a political figure ah, some wizened hardened person like that and then more visual metaphors from the natural world, of course, simple ones, easy to draw a leaf. Think of all the things that a leaf represents. How do we move things along a network? The flow outward of water, the flow backward of, of energy through photosynthesis, uh, any network. This is Federal Express, you know, starting from here, delivering to multiple points. And then we could take our leaf and we could have it represent some other things as well. We could have uh, the same visual now if it starts to be destroyed representing less pleasant ideas. You know, what destroys a network? Well, perhaps cancer or destruction or a terrible disease. You know, and we can show how those using our metaphors are eating away at what our network. We can use animals, elephant, wisdom, longevity, also something threatened. We can make a metaphor of more of our animals, an ostrich with his head, her head stuck in the sand representing uh, something that's gangly and willfully unaware of what's coming along. And then there is a second set of metaphors, metaphors that we can pull from the world that we have created. One of the best visual metaphors ever, of course, is a bridge. Very simple to draw, connecting two ideas, spanning a problem, or a wall that's separating two things, or a set of stairs that are allowing us to go from one level of ability to an entirely new level of ability. More visual metaphors from the engineered, human-made world. Think of all the things that the links of a chain represent. Strength through numbers. Also the idea that we're only as strong as our weakest link. Think about distribution, networks, organizational charts representing different systems of command and control, different ways of influence, perhaps democ democratic if it comes from the bottom moving to the top, totalitarian if it comes from the top moving to the bottom. A balance, of course, can represent a million things. A compass, a sense of purpose, a sense of direction. Our filter, our funnel again, a sales funnel, 
a process, anything that goes from many through to few. Balloons representing vision, things that go up. Detection, radar screens, visuals that show us looking out into the world and detecting the things that are out there. Competition, tracking customers. A little mouse hole can be a metaphor for things that we're trying to hide about being safe, about being secure, but at the same time about being tempted to step outside. And perhaps very specific things from engineering, a uh, little protractor, measuring device, talking about numbers, or precision, or accuracy, or collecting information. And a door, visual metaphor representing so many different things. Is the door opening, or is the door closing? Am I going in, or am I coming out? And of course we can have a cage that represents a world perhaps where we don't want to get locked in or a world we want to break out of. Lots and lots of different visual metaphors that become the nth degree of the drawings that we can make. And I want to end with one simple thought for you. The presentation magic of drawing. Exactly what I've been doing with you for the entire time that we've been online today. Let's say there's a little rabbit coming out of my magic hat as well. The magic of drawing live. And here's what I wanted to end with you. When you are doing a presentation, especially a live presentation, here's a neat little trick of the trade. If we draw most of our picture in advance and then touch it up live, our audience will be glued to the presentation. In a way, they will think the audience, it's a little bit of slate of hand, it is literally visual magic. The audience will think that we have drawn the entire picture in front of them and will participate with us in this presentation no matter how long it goes. So for example, I'm preparing my presentation. Here's my laptop. I open up my page and I put in the beginnings of my drawing. And then I stop. And then when I go and I make my formal presentation, I open up my laptop, I open up my PowerPoint in which I've already created a drawing, I show the partially created drawing to my audience and then I add the last bit. The arrow that connects the pieces of the drawing or I circle one part and say this is what's important. The live marking up of a pre-created drawing during a presentation is literally magic. And I can tell you from my own experience, I know this to be true, that it is possible to keep an audience occupied and in their seats for hours, for hours, if we just follow this simple step. We create our, most of our picture in advance, we finish the picture live. Exactly what I've been doing with you for the last 40 minutes. And let's conclude now with a bit of homework, wrapping up this section on the pictures that we use to tell our story, the homework remains the same. We've been getting excellent response on this homework. So I'm going to do it for another two weeks, and then I'll tell you why. So here's what your homework is. I want you to tell a picture story, and in this case, I want you to draw three to ten pictures that tell a story without words. Put it into a little slide presentation. Hey, thank you all for another great lesson. This is Dan signing off from the Napkin Academy, but don't go away. Now on our new platform, you can still submit your homework. Debbie, our community manager, is going to join you right now to show you exactly how to do that. And I really encourage you, do your homework. Okay, take it away, Debbie. See you soon. We hope you enjoyed this Napkin Academy classic video. We've made it easier than ever to share your homework. After you've completed your homework and have a JPEG or PNG file saved on your computer, come back to this course. Once you're back here, scroll to the bottom of the screen, and in the comments box, you can add a comment. I'm just going to call this one my homework. You can also add images by clicking on the Insert Edit Image button here. In the source box, click on the file. In the Images window, click on Upload, and then click on Add Files. This is going to take you to your computer where you can search for your images. I'm just going to search for mine in Pictures, and I'm going to choose this image here. You can also add multiple images here. Click Upload. After the upload is complete, click Close. Then scroll down. And you'll see that the last image is here, and it's checked. This is the one we just uploaded. Click Insert. 
I suggest in the dimensions box you change the maximum to 1200 pixels and leave the constrained proportions box checked. You can also add an image description here if you'd like. Click OK. You'll see that your image has been added to your comment. And now the last step, the most important one, make sure that you click the green comment button here to upload your homework to the Napkin Academy. We hope to see your homework soon.